Thank you for being here. Thanks for coming to church this morning, even though it's Tuesday. <laughs> but every day is a day at church. <clears throat> and uh, yoga <clears throat> is a personal practice that you do for yourself every day. Uh, actually and naturally, daily, non-obsessively, every day <laughs> is yoga practice. Uh, it would be going to a studio you know, a couple of times a week or once a week would be like going to a Christian going to church and praying on Sunday <laughs> and hoping like hell it's going to be useful. <laughs> and going to yoga once a week at a studio and doing somebody else's patterning uh, won't work. You won't get the results. It's a leisure class activity, mainly of you know the uh, you know the white rich of the West. This turn yoga, you go to yoga and you do somebody's patterning, you know. And a lot of this is quite abusive. I, there was a story yesterday, a lovely, you know, midlife uh, yoga teacher actually. And it's just like it's a given thing, is that you adjust people and you help them get into postures and you use all manner and means to get into shapes and forms. And this lady was, uh, somebody leaned on her, you know, pushed her further down. In, and she's torn a, a, some sort of supple tendon or ligament in her muscularity. That's now giving her a lot of aggravating pain. And this is a very common story. It's, this is what happens everywhere. It's sort of the dirty secret of yoga. <clears throat> but unfortunately, yoga has been branded like this by young men who ran away from their teacher early on in their life, you know, even at the age of 21, ran away and never had any uh, education on the technologies of asana and how to give it to each and every ordinary person according to who you are, according to your need. So today that our subject, our formal subject that drew you all here, probably didn't, but you might have read that Banda is Bhakti. And that your asana, doing asana that's right for you, that is therefore actual yoga, that is therefore your actual intimacy with reality itself, the power of this cosmos that brought you here in the first place and presently sustained you, that presently breathes you and beats your heart and moves your sex and grows your hair. <laughs> and allows your eyes to see and your ears to hear and your mind to conceive, perceive, you know. All of that is there because power is there, you know, life is there. Whatever life is, the cosmos has, <laughs> I love what we were saying yesterday, this eternity of existingness has arrived at this point, hasn't it? Like it really has. And I love this. However long ago, maybe, was, it, was it a billion years or two billion or three? We were green sludge, weren't we? You were a speck of green sludge <laughs> on a muddy waterway somewhere with some sunlight on you, right? Weren't you? Yeah, I guess yeah. so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and three billion years on of Mother Earth's dedicated process, here you are. Now, Mother Earth cares for you. She wouldn't have done all that processing if she didn't want you to be here. And Mother Earth, including the context of Mother Earth, which is the cosmos, right? That is sun and moon and stars and un, you know, known and unknown stars in some sort of profound configuration and balance that we don't know about in an infinity of space, right? All of that is a process that has brought us, brought you, brought your body into existence. Now, I'm just speaking of fact, aren't I? Mm -hmm. This is not some spiritual talk or some sort of 
philosophical speculation. This is a fact that your body is eternity. Your body has been brought forth by eternity in a vast infinity of relatedness and time and space. Right? Am I right? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> So your yoga is your embrace of that, of what you are. Right? And there must be a yoga in the present time because we are so restricted in body and mind. You know, the public mind, you know, and the sort of historic time, you know, measure it with 500 BC or something with the invention of Buddhism and then Christianity or whatever, you know, Islam, Judaism has created uh, thought structures in our human life <clears throat> and power mechanisms that we're all lined up to. And we're all trying to get somewhere in those uh, presumed attainments, you know, working, working, struggling, struggling. And this modern day yoga thing is just one more of that. You know, struggling with some misogynist gymnastics that some young men had created business out of in Europe. Mr. Iyengar going to Europe in 1954 and impressing the pants off Yehudi Menuhin and others. And go, wow, that's so amazing. Yeah, well, it is kind of amazing book of photography, you know, this light on yoga. But there's no education in it of the actual what, what is yoga. The yoga that is your direct embrace of reality itself. The eternity, power of the cosmos that brought you here in the first place from green sludge <laughs> to a human body over three billion years or whatever. It is your intimacy with that which you are. You cannot account for how could a hand exist, you know. How can I how come I can go like this? Let alone how come I can embrace another human being and create a new life or in, <clears throat> share the alchemy of sharing pranas with somebody else? You know, sharing energy. Don't, don't want to use any tricky words here. <laughs> sharing energy with somebody else, you know. Um, we can do that. We can, we can be intimate with our own state our own reality, our own natural state. We can do that. And I want you to do it. I want you to do it. You know? And I, I also want to make the point that three billion years from green sludge to a human body, did I say a million or a billion? It's more than a million. A billion. Billion, right? Yeah. Indicates that Mother Earth and her ecologies are very interested in supporting the human species. You'd think, wouldn't you? <laughs> yeah. 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 And, you know, lots of doom and gloom. You know, we have 30 years left of, of this ecology that can support the human species, and then we're all gone with many other species, apart from cockroaches. <laughs> <laughs> and crickets. Mm. <laughs> They'll survive. Hardy creatures. Mm. They will be gone. So doom and gloom. And there's a there's a sort of like um, kind of a blunt cynicism in the public, like, oh what you know, what can it's too too late, what can we do? Or you even know. leave like now we're a plague anyway. Yeah, exactly. The human <laughs> infestation on planet Earth. That uh, he has to destroy us. Yeah. Destroy the bastards. <laughs> because it's so terrible right? but I say this mother earth wants you here and your grandchildren here and your grandchildren's grandchildren because mother earth has designed us and we are an extraordinary species with a strong upright spine <clears throat> a great crown that can feel and perceive you know like the the, the brain core is the most perceptive mechanism known in the known universe <laughs> to us. And we have a soft frontal line that can feel and we can stand upright. <laughs> We're amazing. 
We are built for relatedness, these bodies of ours. We're built for intimacy, human touch, you know. And furthermore, we have got to a point in evolution of the species that we can perceive our own reality. We can look out at the beauty of Mother Nature and go, whoa, oh, you know? Mm -hmm. I'm sure we do all on a regular basis here. <clears throat> and I just want to point out that it is the beauty of life perceiving the beauty of life. You are the beauty. Perceiving beauty, aren't you? Mm. Yeah. So you are Mother Nature, right? Have you noticed that everything in the natural world is utterly beautiful? Yeah. yeah. Utterly, you like unspeakable. Oh, yeah. You know, a tree. Oh. <laughs> I love trees. Yeah. A leaf. <laughs> oh. <laughs> However the human thought structures that have been created by civilization and religious technologies of trying to get to God as if God is not the present condition has denied us our own experience of beauty, perceiving beauty. We, humanity imagines that they are, we are separate from our own reality. And clearly we are not Right? Is everybody at one with life here? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It's a ridiculous conversation, isn't it? This conversation is really ridiculous. <laughs> that we have two mothers in the room, first time mothers. Like, whoa, you, you must be feeling the perfect wonder power of the cosmos that is arising literally rising as pure intelligence, right? <clears throat> Sex is pure intelligence. The male-female collaboration, pure intelligence, unspeakable beauty, power of the cosmos, perfect harmony of the cosmos has arrived and created a life in you. It's taken four billion years for Mother Earth to bring forth, you know? And Mother Earth wants that birth to be successful and wants your baby to flourish in the ecologies and the abundance of Mother Earth. And when you, I think the mothers and the fathers have a special kind of <clears throat> a gift given to them that you you experience this, you know, when your baby comes out of the womb. It's like, oh, how could it be? <laughs> there was nothing. Now look, well, I mean, this is, this is the beyond, one great guru said, this is the beyond. Here is God, right? So I rest my case. God and sex, now we get both. That's the subject. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, sorry, that's... <laughs> no, but it's one, my, a dear friend of mine said to me, who's uh, translating the book, God and Sex, right now, she said, what other subject could there be? This is the subject, God and sex. Now we get both. And Mark and Amanda were there the other day at Flow Festival. I, I rest my case, God and sex, now you get both. <laughs> you know? I mean, it's so obvious that we shouldn't have to talk about it, but we do need to talk about it because humanity has been dissociated from our own reality in our thought structures. We're not actually dissociated. We are connected as the cosmos, power of cosmos. We are the beauty, but the thought structures, just because the mind has evolved and can think, we have thought structures like seeking for God or doing amazing gymnastics, you know, this yoga, that yoga, trying to meditate, trying to reside as awareness and all the gimmicks that they come up with in the power structures. We have these thought structures and a pers uh, an identity, a personality of someone trying to know God or someone trying to get enlightened or somebody trying to be spiritual. And you're busy with that identity and those thought structures and the boring practices of trying to 
get to the improved condition that some power structure or some idiot who says he's a perfect person. Look at that poor woman walking last night. Yeah. Another story. We met a lovely woman on the <clears throat> on our walk to the beach. Anyway, an ordinary Australian woman who was eating and walking as a discipline, as a struggle to lose weight. Same thing. <laughs> you know, not enjoying her life. Hardly eating anything. Obsessive exercise. Because she had a somewhat of a larger body type and her friends were giving her a hard time for being a little larger than them. And so she was... That's it. Thanks for that example, Rosalind. Of some social idealism such as God or skinny body type or angular face, you know, like what happened to Michael Jackson. <laughs> yeah. And how sick it is. You see that sickness in society and, you know, searching for God with uh, <coughs> gymnastics that they're calling yoga these days or trying to reside as awareness, you know, witnessing your mind, your troubled mind or witnessing all arising conditions until you arrive, <coughs> abide as awareness, consciousness itself, are all gimmicks that's creating the suffering of humanity in the denial of what you are and who you are. And what you are and who you are, you are eternity in this body. You are the power of the cosmos arising as pure intelligence and utter beauty. In perfect harmony with the rest of the cosmos. And I'm saying there must be a return to the pre-doctrinal yogas. This shamanic activity that was, you know, there, how long? 100,000 years or something, you know indigenous this beautiful thing that that happened where we were playing uh sitar of a didgeridoo and sai the didgeridoo player said he just had a vision of india and australia being one continent you know one people you know like, well because <laughs> how long has humanity been wandering in the vedic culture <clears throat> and then the aboriginal you know and in those cultures, they develop the shamanic activity of each person's direct intimacy with reality itself. It was, you know, humble people, non-hierarchical people's activity. No power structure. They hadn't invented religion or doctrine. This is where yoga comes from. And it's a beautiful thing. And then, between the 8th and the 13th century, it was codified in a great body of literature called the Tantras. It was flourished in Hindu and Buddhist India and Tibet. It was huge, it went everywhere, everybody did it. And then the orthodoxy male power structures came in and obliterated and created the male dominance over the feminine and the denial of the feminine and the denial of sex as a human, a positive human activity. And that's where we are today. And we are, we are here to correct that now, <laughs> which is, by the way, why we put out that book, God and Sex, now we get both. It's, it's a gesture of correction of the cultural fault that presumes that you are separate from your own reality. Now, Remy, you are not separate from your own reality, are you? You are in a perfect harmony with air and light and water and green, right? Now, can you believe it? You are in a perfect harmony with the male-female collaboration. In your own embodiment and potentially with another body, whether it's same-sex or opposite-sex intimacy. And I want to assure you, I, I want to promise you that if you do this yoga of strength receiving, if you do asana, which is hatha yoga, strength receiving, inhale, merging with the exhale, Asana is Hatha Yoga, the non-dual Tantra, non-dual, direct embrace of reality itself. You will enjoy the male-female harmonies in your own embodiment that will give you the ability to do that with somebody else. And I promise you that. It's well known. So Krishna Chai is a 
Desic Chat. Yoga is a catalyst that brings out your latent talents. And if you would just practice it actually naturally, daily, non-obsessively, it'll come out, it'll come forth for you. All these latent talents that you have. And um, I'm excited for you. <laughs> that that is there for you. You're going to be entering into that um, mystic unfolding of the skills and talents that you have in life, including the relationship skills, including sexual intimacy skills and talents that you have, and obviously because Mother Nature has given them to you and has taken her four billion years to give them to you. And she completely supports you and wants that for you. My teacher, UG, used to say there's only one thing Mother Nature is interested in, and that is you duplicating an improved version of yourself before you leave the planet. <laughs> the continuity and evolution of the species. I'm saying that because he said it, and I got it, but I'm not saying that because I'm saying that, you know, everybody should go out and multiply. <laughs> no, but it's just that that's how powerful it is no requirement for any of us necessarily to have have a baby but that is how powerful it is and if we do our asana in the way that is right for us this is what will be delivered into and I want to thank you Remy and thank you Malika for you getting on to this you know in Bali two weeks in Bali and you just going oh my god you know, and feeling it's relevant, and then meeting you, your best friend in life. Can I be your best friend too? <laughs> <laughs> you introduced me as her best friend, it was so lovely. And you're onto it, you're feeling it, aren't you? Strength, <coughs> receiving, this alchemy of strength receiving. And you understanding its potential in the human dynamic of yeah, male, female is equals and opposites, where one empowers the other in an endless exchange of receptivity. Primarily receptivity, not strength. And we're saying if you receive through the crown and frontal line, right to the base of the body, the, the genitals become part of that nurturing quality receptivity of life. And then the genitals become useful to each other. Right. And that changes the whole dynamic of uh, sex and the terror that's been put upon the modern public. And the doctrinal pu public, you know, what went before in a doctrinal system like Christianity and Islam and so forth, and Buddhism and Hinduism, a dreadful misogyny of denial of life, denial of the feminine, the denial of sex, the denial of each other, you know, and then sex coming out as an illness. And you know, it is time, it is time for us to address that and teach real yoga in the streets. And that's why I love what's happening here. You're in the streets of Perth teaching real yoga. Streets. <laughs> <laughs> The yoga <laughs> Acknowledged by the state government and the police force. Yeah, real yoga. <laughs> That's what you need, is real yoga. <laughs> Not more policemen. <laughs> so uh, I had a funny thing happen with uh, my dear friend Eugene. We were sitting in a um, a Swiss chalet and uh, suddenly uh, we noticed that there were two cockroaches uh, crawling out of the microwave oven. They've been in the microwave oven and you see. And it's been on, right? Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, Yuji was talking about climate chaos. So this was <laughs> 10 years ago before it was such a critical matter. But we, he was talking about it, and he was still saying, you know, humanity is fucked, you better get your act together, or you're gone. Mm -hmm. what, what he was saying. And then two cockroaches came out of the microwave, and he said, see? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
So the cockroaches will survive climate chaos, global warming. And he was just like very, he was a very serious dude, you know? <laughs> Prove my point. <laughs> and I raise that because Australia is burning and people are dying and the koala bears are dying in their millions and the other species, the kangaroos and so forth. And it's a terror, it's a deep, deep sadness, you know. But this, for all of us, you know, my certainty <clears throat> is that if we can teach this yoga on the street corners, like we are here, like Malika and Remy are doing, this will urgently fix It'll come right. You know. When, when the, in the public mind, if it's new information that I am, we are not separate from our own reality, and I can be intimate with my own reality, and I can be intimate with each other, you know, then it empowers us to uh, go and do what we need to do to, uh, you know take the plastics out of the ocean and, uh, and <clears throat> work with clean energy and probably even come up with some science technologies that, you know, take the carbon out of the atmosphere somehow or other and some great you know, new technologies and things. We can do it. We can do it. And we would get busy in doing that and we'd stop, you know, like building stupid automobiles and we've stopped flying so much, and you know, we get intelligent. We would do urgently right now, this year, what we have to do <laughs> to uh, cool the planet. But so far, we can't do that because the public are numb, or the public are just desperate and disconsolate and don't, just don't know what to do. And and the patterns are so deeply ingrained, you know, of consumerism and fuel consumption and everything. It just goes on and on and on and on and nobody can really feel what's, what, you know, I don't know even these fires in Australia, I don't even know if that is getting the world to feel what's happening. You feel what's happening when you're in the fire. Mm -hmm. You know, Yuji used to say, it is not love that's gonna save humanity, it's fear that's gonna save humanity. You know, when you actually see what's going on, then, you know, which brings me to the other point. When you can honestly see in your life your restriction in your life, uh, what Krishnamacharya called the unavoidable motive of practice, where you can go, oh, yeah, I could feel better, mm. or I feel bad, I just had a dreadful breakup with, you know, <clears throat> whatever, then you go, ah, oh, okay. I have to practice, you know, <laughs> and then practice proceeds, the unavoidable motive of practice. And I think that's where we are personally in, in the mass public and we are in the public, we are there, we're at that point where we have to take some action, you know, we have to take action. And I really appreciate it out there at Flow Festival at Mark and Amanda facilitated a panel um, and it was a beautiful sharing, a sad, sad sharing, you know, an urgent sharing. With people with emotions saying, well, what can we do? What's the next step? Uh, you know, and angry sort of activists, you know, saying, you know, <laughs> we're getting all miserable and, and it was, an interesting outcome and uh, Rosalind was there and you, I, I like the contribution that you made Rosalind and just to sort of start this off, um, could, could we hear from you please, just a little bit of, you know, so, sorry to put it on you, but you know, this matter rel relative to yoga and relative to Australia burning down. And relative to Bhakti, yeah. <laughs> all of it, 
Yeah. Could you come and speak, please? Because yeah. I want to hear this. I want you to hear from Rosalind for a little bit, everybody. Um, let me say, Rosalind is an activist. She was in Greenpeace for a number of years. No longer. And she's had a, a career as a, um, a sea woman uh, sailing ships. And so, you know, she's done a lot of things and she's climbed up the sides of ships to prevent illegal fishing. And all kinds of things. <laughs> yeah. She was a rugged, hardy, you know, warrior woman. And it was very interesting to me, it's been interesting for her, I know that then she found yoga. And, uh, in, and she found that this yoga actually served her purpose as an activist, as an environmentalist. And before uh, meeting me, she was a little cynical about yoga, not a little, completely cynical, like fucking wankers. And, <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, the world's burning down and you're doing yoga. <laughs> and your Lululemon. Fuck, get real. She was like that. Forgive the invisible judgments I was sending through my mind. <laughs> and uh, then you stumbled into a yoga education. And you ha I know you haven't stopped being an activist. And I know you haven't stopped weeping when you see a photo of a koala bear. And saying, I miss koala bears. I'm going to miss, you know, she's deeply feeling human being. And... Uh, she weeps a lot at the condition of the human species and all the other species, and you see what's happening. And I know that your, your life, you can't help yourself. Your biology is programmed to deal with the situation. It's just like Mother Nature's biology that is in all of us, that is all of us, is programmed to deal with the fault of culture that is preventing us from being fully cooperative with the intrinsic harmonies that this body has with Mother Nature. It's functioning in her. Her, her mind, her intellect, her life energy is given to doing something that can be done on planet Earth right now. And I want her to share that with you for a few moments. And um, because I think it might be useful to you. So thank you. Well, maybe it would be useful. These, all these emotions are stirred up is for me to just explain from my perspective how what we're doing here or how thunder is bhakti is relevant to the climate situation because I think it's not really generally seen as um, as being a relevant form of action to do yoga. It's kind of seen as a self-indulgent wellness industry, selfish, self-obsession, or maybe at best self-care so that you can go and do the real work somewhere else, right? And, um, uh, you know, for, for me, I, uh, I see it's completely not about um, what we're doing, but about um, the, the culture and the mode of perception that's, that we are cultivating and promoting in the world, whether through the activism or through, through the yoga, you know, like it's happening at that invisible level rather than the kind of grotesque, um, literal, literal level. And uh, so, you know, we use this phrase, banda is bhakti, what does it mean? Like, because banda is normally like, you know, energy locks in the body where you use parts of the muscles, right? to send energy around the body and in the typical yoga um, paradigm you do it aggressively you know you you um, the goal is to get a certain kind of energetic experience to, so you can feel like a spiritual person or so you can have a certain experiential high or so whatever the goal is there and uh, it's like a, a manipulation of the spiritually ambitious mind over the ecology of the body and so um, I'm suggesting like that this is the land, you know, this is the, the mother nature, just as the, uh, the land in the forest that's burning is mother nature, or just as any land that's being dug up and ransacked is mother nature. So for me, when I first started sort of reading about environmental issues and grieving, I thought I was just caring about the land, but I was really grieving for what had been done by culture to my own ecologies, you know. Part of me was resonating with with um, 
that experience. I was, I was resonating with the Earth's experience, even though I thought I was just reading facts. Where was the grief coming from, really? You know, it was, it was that I knew in my own experience, the same Western culture that's creating more harmful patterns that we're looking at is also had also created the patterns in my own head of busy, busy, busy. You know, like keep other people happy. Uh, um, try and manipulate this thing to look a certain way, you know? Try and manipulate it to not listen to its own intelligence, not listen to even the most simple things like when it needs to go to the toilet or when it needs to eat or when it needs to sleep, you know? How are we supposed to listen to the great body of nature if we don't listen to the most simple messages that nature is sending, you know? Like if we're, if we're sitting in this class right now and need to go to the toilet, <laughs> That is nature speaking, right? We call it the call of nature. <laughs> and so what happens if the social obligation to not offend me as the speaker overrides that, you know? Whatever. Then instantly you have the entire human dynamic of climate and everything, which is that nature is speaking, but some kind of social imperative is preventing action, you know? And so like that culture can change in, in our own bodies, you know? And it, the culture only exists in our own bodies. It only exists in individuals. And it only exists as it is being um, embodied, yeah. And so, like, if we take this thing, Banda is Bhakti, seriously. It's like, Bhakti is devotion, right? Uh, almost like surrender, it's love, kind of. Um. So if my Banda is Bhakti, it implies some kind of giving over of my mind to the energy of my body. This implies, it implies some kind of a gesture of respect and um, some kind of reversal of the normal cultural mode, which is the mind as the head of the family and the head of the state controlling the land and using the land as a resource and farming the land and selling the land, you know, and uh, making the land perform various things, you know. Does this make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. And so, like, to find a mode of yoga that is actually going to address the cultural issues that we're facing it has to be something from the bottom up. You know, it has to be something that respects and honors the organic life of our bodies. It can't be something that imposes ideal poses or ideal energetic states or tries to, like, you know, like, manipulate energy to try and. Um, get a certain experience and squeeze it out of the body, you know? Like it has to be something that takes this controlling center and gives it over, which is why we have this whole gesture of this of Jalandara Bandha. It's like the head, which is just full of so many ideas that are unoriginal, and you can tell because everyone has the same ones, bowing down to the heart, you know, and giving over to the intelligence of the body. Like that is the gesture of respect that culture is required to do in order to um, listen to the land and to heal the land, you know? It's not another gesture of power and control, which is what is the dynamic expressed in a kind of um, violent yoga, in a kind of, uh, in a, in a, uh, you know? Like, that is <laughs> totally ridiculous activity. It's, it's just more violence on, on the body. And it's, it's totally pointless. Like, why do that? <laughs> what is the motivating factor? And then once people get injured, you get all of these kind of complicated systems to prevent that kind of injury. So say, while you're doing this ridiculous struggle of the command and control, also drop your shoulders, you know, ugh. <laughs> <laughs> but if you don't address that underlying logic of, um, I must push my body to make it fit some kind of ideal. You know, I am a worse person if I can't get as deep into the fortitude. <laughs> you know? It, it, I must attain some kind of external ideal. I'm not good enough until I um, have a certain kind of experience or a certain kind of peace or a certain kind of energy. I'm not part of life until I feel blissfully connected to life. It's like, how's the person who can say that even living to say that. Did you track that? <laughs> and so like 
for me, I'm completely fed up with the entire yoga industry. I see this almost, almost all just complicit in this cultural problem that we're facing. It can just be discarded, just thrown out, just laughed at, you know, as a ridiculous activity. But then that shouldn't be thrown out with bathwater, which is what I originally did as an activist, because there is this potential for a yoga of embodiment and of like total profound devotion to the intelligence of the body that has to be practiced to rewire the system, you know, it has to actually have the breath doing something to release all of this toxicity from our system, you know, it just, we can't release um, cultural patterns by analysing them, by thinking about them, by talking about them. It just doesn't work. It goes round and round and round and round. So I, I, I no longer want to throw out the, the yoga with bath water. But I think um, I think it's more appropriate to share it in communities like this who are being like, Australia is being actively affected by the results of a certain um, dominator culture, you know. So there's a high level of like focus, intelligence, activation, motivation, like, okay, we are completely sure that what we've been doing is not working. You know, we no longer have allegiance to these systems because the evidence is there that they're dysfunctional, you know. And so it becomes much easier for people to shake free of those logics. And I think that's the kind of people who need to be practicing and sharing because this is, um, We'll be, we'll be the ones who have the motivation to actually um, practice on a different basis, you know, on a, on a basis of reverence, on a um, autonomy, empowerment, um, completely, completely and utterly respectful of every piece of nature, you know. Like my, I'd say my guru, William Blake, the poet, he wrote the most beautiful lines. He wrote that um, everything that lives is holy. And you can imagine a culture built on that basis would just not be in this trouble, you know? It just wouldn't have that problem. So how do you build a culture on that basis? It has to be embodied. It can't be people talking about that as an idea. He wrote also that the tree that moves some to tears of joy is to others just a green thing that stands in the way. As a man is, sorry about the man part, so he sees. So as a person is, so they see. He's saying everybody sees everything completely differently based on what they are embodying in their own uh, perceptual lens. But he didn't believe that we were just lost in some kind of postmodern murk of just ideas. He, uh, he also wrote these famous lines that if the doors of perception were cleansed, then everything would appear as it is, which is infinite. And you might have heard of the band The Doors, which is where they got the name from, it's from this beautiful quote. And to me, these are the words of a yogi because he's talking about the exact things that the entire yoga tradition has studied and perfected. Well, okay, not the entire yoga tradition, but that certain channels of the yoga tradition have offered, which is, uh, you know, how do you discard the layers or the, the murk, the perceptual lens, so that you can see everything in the beauty that it is? And as soon as you see, like, a person, for example, and the beauty that they are, then you can love them. And as soon as you love them, you treat them right. And no amount of rules will ever make us treat something right if we don't have the ability to see it and love it. So I feel like what we're doing and what we're sharing is just the ability to love the world and uh, that's like the most important thing that could be shared right now so i hope that makes uh, could you just talk about this now thunder is about to be relevant to that yeah but this transition between being of course an activist as you know we all are here we want to save this world well and like then the transition of that um passion to one that involves a yoga, a yoga participation. I mean, you had that in your own case. How do you see that happening for the world? Well, for a start, I saw the complete inefficiency and total mess of the activist movements, you know. 
I was on the Rainbow Warrior three months and I think achieved fuck all, you know, <laughs> at a cost of 50,000 euros a day or something. <laughs> and um, not for lack of really sincere people, but just because, um, you know, was it Einstein who said you can't solve a problem with the thinking that caused the problem? If you're putting out press releases that say something like, every household will lose $14,000 a year from climate change, you're trying to motivate people, but what, you're really, what it's really doing is affirming the value that money is the most important thing. It's not just responding to culture, it's creating culture. Everything that is said is empowered, you know, in a certain weird way, it is, is effective, you know. So, um, my, and I have to be honest with myself about my own involvement with activism, as my motives were, like I joked, but it was true, attention seeking, to look like a hero, to be admired by other people, to be a good girl, you know, to get a pat on the back for doing a good job, you know, like, if those things made me ineffective in these, anybody who's been in a sort of activist community has just seen the total mess that happens, like any community, when people don't have a practice for dealing with their own issues, <laughs> and that we don't, don't have a practice of being calm, unity, with unity in, their, in themselves, you know, it's, it's just a mess, it's just a total mess. So, I found that, um, for me, practicing, practicing actually gave me access in my own body to the kind of feelings that William Blake was talking about. You know, I liked trees before, but I didn't actually feel tears of joy under a tree, you know. I just would have had it on my fridge as a fridge magnet. I would have consumed someone else's inspiration, but I wouldn't have thought it could be mine, you know. <laughs> I'd have been a fan of Blake and a consumer of him, you know, the way we are of inspirational books and things with no means to translate that inspiration into actuality. And even a kind of cynicism where that might be possible. You know, like, oh, it's just human nature or something like that. And uh, so I had, I finished a whole thesis on, on Blake, for example, tried to write a conclusion and came across this quote from him that said, the true faculty of knowledge is experience. Uh, <laughs> Awkward. <laughs> so, two years of work. <laughs> Is what I'm writing about in my experience. <laughs> and so, you know, like, I've needed to have some way to actually release pain difficulty, bad experiences, bias, victim identity. I've needed a way to release all of this shit out of my system because every piece of that pain was clenching me somewhere, you know? And so the more clenched you are, the more tight you are, the less you can feel. <laughs> and so all it is is, I mean, yoga's just relaxation. But relaxation is like the most profound word there is, you know? <laughs> I don't mean like numbing out eating a bag of chips in front of the TV, it's not relaxation, you know? If you measure the body and the heart rate when it's doing that, it's actually still really stressed. But it's just, it's just managed to sort of blanket its own stress with like a warm duvet of comfort. <laughs> and so, yeah, there needs to be some kind of an actual, an actual practice that, and then you hardly even need to have this conversation. I mean, we shouldn't even be talking now, we should be doing the practice. <laughs> It's just for fun, you know. Um, and then, like, I feel effective. I just did not feel effective as an activist before. I felt, like, angry and frustrated, you know. Like, the bastards, they're not listening. <laughs> let's tell people how bad they are even more, even though they're not listening. <laughs> then let's tell people how bad they are for not listening. <laughs> then let's feel how bad we ourselves are. You know? <laughs> and, uh... You know, but, but I hear people who actually take it on in their own life and just this spontaneous profundity comes out of their mouths. They say stuff like, they don't even know they're being profound. They're just humble, a humble person comes to a teacher training and says, oh, I feel less expensive. I don't really need to buy stuff anymore. Like, they've 
learned how to fill the gaping hole of lack in their own solar plexus with something. They, they learned how to drink from the well in the middle of the desert, not running around pestering other people for a drink of water anymore, you know, hassling them. And so it's like they've got access to that, that well in themselves. And suddenly they don't need to like be chucking material objects and other people's opinions into this insatiable, gaping black hole of lack, you know. <laughs> Which is not is not fillable. And that's you know, like I think it's so redemptive of our love for other people to give people the credit to say that we're not consumers by nature. You know, we need to understand what has happened psychologically, emotionally, sexually to people to make them need to consume the world so ravenously. Something's happened, you know. Sorry to quote Blake all the time, but his version is so uh, he wrote, more, more, more is the cry of a mistaken soul. And then he wrote, less than all cannot satisfy. You know, like if you have less than the feeling of the all, the feeling of being part of the all, the feeling of um, all there is to feel, full range of emotion, full range of humanity, then uh, then you'll just be going more, more, more. And he also wrote, you know, like that um, if, if, a, if a human's desires are infinite, then they must desire the infinite. Do you get it? I love this, it's so beautiful, you know? It's so like neat and elegant and just nails it, you know? And so like, rather than telling people off for having infinite desires and being like, you need to consume less, you're a bad person. What is your straw made out of? Where were your underwear made? You know, like, <laughs> it's so fucking stressful to keep track of all this shit. You, know, you just can't do it. <laughs> but what you can do is like, take the take the um, the natural feeling that we have desire for infinity and actually satisfy it with infinity rather than try and satisfy it with random shit you know because all the random shit is running out and it's polluting the planet <laughs> I'm sorry if it sounds negative to anybody I feel really positive about it, it. Is. <laughs> it is you found that you stopped consuming spirituality and everything yeah. else yeah. when you began a yoga practice. Yeah, I was a bliss junkie. <laughs> yeah. But also a Blake junkie. You had this love of this profound mystic type of yeah. anyone. But I was like the academic scabby loser looking at him like a tiger in the zoo, you know? Like, <laughs> wow, he's so amazing, you know? Like, and not <laughs> realizing that what was my secret opinion of myself throughout that process and you know in the universities you're encouraged to be as neutral as possible but of course you're never neutral because there's a person sitting behind the keyboard you know what is that person feeling they're going to be feeling something it's probably complete numbness you know and uh so i found like it has to be embodied you know i feel like blake is my friend because he's just talking about human experience for everybody. He's not saying, I'm so special with me and my mystic feelings. And maybe if you buy my online course, you can also have mystic feelings too. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know like if you look around in the spirituality scene, it's just people constantly talking about what they've attained and what their state is. You know, it's like I, 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 I. And all it does is so different because then you start thinking, well, I don't feel good all the time like that person. Or I'm not enlightened, I'm not special, you know. And then you feel even worse about yourself and you have to go out and buy more stuff. <laughs> <laughs> or buy another course. Or buy another, you know, like, feeling like a loser. People who feel like losers harm the planet. <laughs> I don't mean it as an attack on any person, you know. I know what it feels like to feel like a loser and you just have to constantly pour input into yourself. It makes insatiable greed it's not a moral failing it's a disease you know and uh you know full compassion for myself and for everybody in that state of insatiable greed you know it's, a, it's just a disease and you wouldn't give someone a hard time for for a bodily disease personally you know you'd be sympathetic and you'd really get serious about trying to heal it you know like, what is the cause of the disease? Not just trying to manage the symptoms. So 
So is that what you were getting at? Yeah, so in summary, are you saying that yoga is activism? Totally, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a bit funny because this word act implies a certain kind of mode of doing, maybe. And you know, the activists hate the spiritual people because they think they're just sitting on their butts while the world burns in neoliberal wellness centres. And the, you know, the spiritual people hate the activists because they think they're just angry and doing shit without any kind of consciousness to it. <laughs> you know, how do you break down these barriers? If you look at England in the 1600s, radical spirituality was political. It wasn't the split. Because if you believed, like many little minor cults did, and I mean cults in that sense, in a good sense, cultures, that you could have a completely autonomous, direct experience of God or reality for yourself, then you are no longer controllable at all by church and state, you know? If you no longer believe the church's message that you're a bad person and you have to come to church so that you can give us money and become a good person, you're, you're, you're no longer controllable, you know? And a, con a non-controllable person is an immense fucking threat, you know, and incredibly enraging. Mm. A non-controllable person irritates um, the conventional mind, you know. Even if, like, for me as a woman, if I meet an insecure male who likes to get, a, um, likes to sort of drape his arms around people to get attention and get off on it, and um, and he, he, that kind of person will always go towards the kind of person who can't say no, you know, and they'll, and they'll, they'll radiate their insecurity, they'll drape their arms over somebody, and the person, the, the person will feel that kind of a feeling and they won't want to hurt their feelings. It's a kind of kindness, but in a weird, twisted kind of way. So what I've noticed is that because I don't care about hurting that person's feelings, my very presence irritates that kind of person. <laughs> it's very interesting, you know? And I think that's the empowerment I would want for everybody, you know? Is that, and that's when we will be able to act effectively, is when we don't care about hurting people's feelings. But we, we care about them. I'm not saying being a hard ass. I'm just saying, like, not able to be manipulated and intimidated by other people's social neurosis. So, what's the way? I can't forward. remember what your question was. I mean, what's the way forward for Australia? Climate chaos. Well, yoga. But actual yoga, not this kind of like bodily abusive. Um, uh, kind of sweat junkie system, you know, and I, it's not, you know what I'm saying, it's not personal, and if people want to do a kind of aerobics gymnastics exercise thing, it's fine as a hobby, the problem is when it's called yoga, then most of the population think, oh, I can't do that, that's not for me, and it's not relevant, and maybe even it's silly, and then you have the whole population missing out on what actual yoga is, which is, um, uh, Falling in love with eternity, recognizing the whole world as alive, falling out of the Western materialist, exploitative, dominator culture and mind, and um, being able to love the world and love other people. You know, that's yoga. What you just said, that last little bit, you should write that down as good dog. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I mean, I'm just saying what I have received from Mark, but not in terms of literal words, just in terms of. He's shared the practice, I've done the practice, and it's given me my own insights, you know? It's not any kind of a, a, a word mental based teaching, it's just a, um, just a practice. And it's kind of like a music lesson, you go to the music lesson and then you play badly and you feel bad, and then you go home and you do your practice, you know? Whereas yoga in the consumerist mode, is, it's more like a music concert, you just go, you have a good time, you never learn how to play your own instrument. And I think that's a really helpful metaphor to share mm. with people. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, yeah like you, you want to play the instrument, so you go home and you practice and you deal with the initial stages of beginning to practice, which is sounding really shit. Or it might, in the yoga case, it might be, well, I don't know what pose to do next, I don't know how to breathe, and I'm not doing it right, and getting these feelings of doubt, you know. And that's what people go through is when they start to practice. But there's a motivation because I want to be able to um, play the beauty and the harmony of my own system. So falling in love with your own life, your own body, your own breath, 
Yeah. Your own sex. Yeah, not being in conflict with stuff. And I think the mystic uh, realizes, such as Christ or Buddha, of course, or Blake, yeah. the mystic poet, they're simply describing what the actual state of life is that we are all in. Already, yeah, I'm not saying yeah. me and my mystic feelings. Yeah, every part, what is it? Every particle of dust. That's Blake again. Yeah, what well, how's it going? He wrote, let me, he's writing a poem and this muse fairy thing comes and sits on the end of his pen and he says, tell me little fairy, what is the world and is it dead? And the fairy says, let me show you the whole world, all alive, where every particle of dust breathes forth joy. Now is that true? Is every particle of dust a miracle? Mm -hmm. Is it true or not? Is it a plain, non-abstract fact? How can there be a particle of dust with light shining on it? And you know, I talk to a lot of people who maybe when they hear this, um, what was that argument? When they hear this thing you're expressing, it's like you are the power of the cosmos. There's a real belief that if I'm not feeling it, it's not true. Do you know what I mean? Or if I'm not feeling that every particle of dust is not sacred, then it must be not true. And I, I remember listening to you talking to someone once about their meditation, and they're like, oh, this one time in meditation I felt really connected, but then the rest of the time I felt bad and disconnected, and then I, one other time I felt really connected. And, and I realized, listening to that, that remember we were talking about it, this thing of like, reality is reality, no matter what the mind is up to, you know? And all my life talking about connection or disconnection, I've given too much power to my mind as if just because I felt disconnected, I was disconnected and it was a real problem that had to be addressed. And then, you you know, when you try and address an imaginary problem, you emphasise the sense of the problem. You know, it is completely pointless to put any energy into addressing imaginary problems. Can we just put that out for a moment to you personally? Is reality still there no matter what your mind is up to? Mm -hmm. Are you always already the power of the cosmos, even though you might have thought structures going, oh, I've really fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't, I don't know anything spiritual. I'm failing in my self-improvement program. I haven't realized much in yoga or meditation. Well, the other people, thing people say is, I still, yeah. Whatever comes next is not good. So is reality, this that beats your heart and moves your breath, is that still there no matter what the mind is up to? Yes. Right. And we are saying this yoga that came from the great tradition, shamanic ancient culture, codified in the tantras up to the 13th century, etc. Folk activity was given in wisdom culture as ordinary activity for ordinary people to do to enjoy and embrace, acknowledge the wonder that is existence, right? And it's easily done. Anybody can do it. Anyone, the Christian Charya, beautiful, gentle, old gentleman, anyone who wants to can do yoga <laughs> in the way that's right for them, their body type, their age, their health, and fit it to their cultural framework of life. You know. And this is, this is the offering, and this is the activism. This is the solution for humanity's illness and the uh, sexual dysfunction of the human life and of our dysfunction with the ecologies of Mother Nature. This is the solution for each person to enjoy reality itself, that they are reality, that the beauty of the tree is the same beauty, it's a different form, but it's the same beauty of the body that is seeing the tree. And then you do, really, you see a tree and it go, and it's, wow, I see the tree, <laughs> shimmering leaves. Yeah, it's communicating and my nervous system is able to receive its communication. And it doesn't require a sort of a drug-induced, improved perception, which is a whole thing that, you know, popular, young popular cultures and ayahuasca and all this sort of uh, delusion of glory that is drug-induced and turning that into a method to get to some 
future place of high perception of the beauty of the cause. It, this is this is a fault and uh, an addiction. You know that we think we need some outside event, substance to happen to perceive better. We, our God-given perceptions are finely, finely tuned. What is consciousness that perceives beauty is a profound, you know, eternity that has arrived as the body, this that can perceive the awareness principle and the perceptions themselves and the relatedness of our perception, you know, my tangible, you, your tangible connection to the father of your child, you know, that is holy. That is the power of eternity, that's bringing a new life forth. There's no requirement to transcend that or uh, go somewhere else in some hoax of a higher realm. When, you know, you and your partner are the power of the beauty of the cosmos and it's already in you as you. And that tangible, rela you, know, you know, touch, direct embrace of what reality is, the power of the cosmos, is given to you when you begin a, a yoga practice. But there must be this yoga practice to uh, reprogram uh, the social restrictions that have been put in us, and bizarre social restrictions. And I can promise you that it happens rather quickly when you begin an actual practice. And I want you to uh, understand what this practice is, and we'll, we'll summarize it, and then we'll do it. Anything else? Well, I was just thinking about what you said yesterday about the Bhagavad Gita having this thing of like not being attached to the the results of action. You know, like the, the quality of action standing in and of itself. And I was thinking about watching one climate scientist who's kind of known as a bit of an exaggerated doomsdayer, saying, "Oh, we've only got thirty years left, or whatever." But what he said as a conclusion to that was. Um, and so the only thing left to do is enjoy your life and, and do and do what you love. And uh, I was watching that and I was like, I don't need to agree with your conclusions in order to think that that's a, that that's a good approach, you know? Like, and when I, when I hear the panicked um, fear narrative uh, of, about activism that says, um, you know, drop everything, you must um, be in war mode, you know, and it's tax tactless to enjoy your life, you should not be enjoying your life, it's an emergency, then I think, well, what's the point of, um, what's the point of seeking to prolong a life that has to be lived on those terms? Do you get what I'm trying to say? Yeah. Um, so I feel like <coughs> what, we're pro what, I'm, what we're proposing at is a functional solution is also like incredibly pleasurable so you'd do it even if it wasn't going to help right. so it's, it's unattached to the, 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 the fruits of the action because it's an inherent enjoyability and Yuji used to call uh, doing yoga was making love with life didn't he say making love with yourself and that's what he said making love with yourself and I, I was worried I corrected them. I said, how could we call it making love with life? People might get a bit confused about what you mean. <laughs> <laughs> making love to yourself. <laughs> but you wouldn't be against that either. <laughs> and it's all fine. But it's just, it's a sign of how the mind habitually goes to the physical rather than the energetic. <coughs> We're talking about coming into a completely life positive relationship with the body as it is with life as it is this body and its relatedness to all tangible conditions solid ground you know air light water green and male female collaboration and same sex or opposite sex intimacy any gender identification or none at all but completely positive completely sex positive is a possibility and even if it's 13 years and we're all out of here and there's only cockroaches left, I say 13 years of completely luck and crickets.
completely uh, a life positive participation in the given reality, <coughs> including your <coughs> male female collaboration, that we have to keep mentioning because it is the power of the cosmos. It is, it is how all life comes through. It's the most essential substance and power of our living forms. But it's been turned into a, a terror that we uh, need to see and understand and do the practices that bring them very quickly back into completely uh, life positive. Right. And I just want to say, I didn't mean to imply that practice is pleasurable all the time, because I know for me, the process of actually feeling involves feeling a lot of really yuck, old stuff that has to be felt and released, and that doesn't feel good at the time. Um, and I was just thinking while you said that, that most of that that there has been to release for me has been trauma from the relational field, you know. And uh, the only thing to do with it has been to just bring the breath into all the little dark nooks and crevices of the body and let it kind of I was thinking I used to scrub the decks on my ship and you first you, you scrub the wood and it brings out all the dirt. I was thinking that's like the inhale, it kind of scrubs it and then you wash it away and then that kind of releases it. And if you just scrub it and bring it up then you'll be in trouble. And if you just try and release without actually getting to the feeling then it won't work either. How to scrub a deck. <laughs> I watched a lot of teenagers mess it up. Okay. Right. So here's the methodology of how to scrub a deck. <laughs> um, we did it yesterday. Just paraphrasing yeah. deck. 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 So. So, um, <laughs> we would like you to scrub the decks every day. <laughs> <laughs> and literally, you know, they actually, in the yoga tradition, cleaning the pot, and it's cleaning the doors of perception, actually, cl cleansing the perceptive mechanism of mind. Right? So, mind is clear. Yeah. Mind does not have a preconceived idea of what you're seeing. And I think everybody knows what that feeling of clarity is because in a certain moments it's broken through. Like often people report in birth or in a, um, some kind of, uh, on, on the top of a mountain or an encounter with an animal, like a, looking into a blue whale's eye or maybe making love or something. There's been a moment when the, um, the noise has parted and there's been a direct experience of how beautiful reality is. But then within the consumer mindset, we don't cognize it as that something fell away. We think an experience was added that we have to then add again, mm -hmm. you know? So it's like a reversal of the logic. We're not trying to add another experience because the whole effort to add experience is actually making more layers and more layers. Mm -hmm. But it was, you know, those moments were grace and that without anything on our part, the waves parted and we could feel our heart, you know, and uh, I think like that, well the way you put it is that the yoga is what you do to respond to that, based in your yogic framework, that that was true, that was reality, it wasn't like a fluke experience, like eating a piece of cheesecake and it felt really good and now it's over. <laughs> That's good though. <laughs> you, you can wait a while and have another one. Yeah. I'm saying I live in a cheesecake. <laughs> can we circle back to this? Um, you know, when practicing, sometimes it doesn't feel good, and there's, especially when it comes to climate stuff, there's a lot of yeah. big stuff to be felt. and. Yeah. Maybe you already went through this yesterday, but the cascade of emotion mm -hmm. is a really important piece of the puzzle. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's your cascade. That's your cue. I don't know, woman, woman. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, at the panel on the 
at the workshop, there was that beautiful man, Chris, who was here yesterday, mm. and, uh, and he was talking about his experiences with Extinction Rebellion and talking about their policies, and he was holding back tears. And I was really touched to see the emotion in his words, but I could see that there was an internal conflict trying to hold back the tears. And so I just wanted to know what he was feeling, so I rudely interrupted him and said, what are you feeling? And then he just started crying and said, I love, I really, I really love this world, you know? And suddenly it was like direct communication to everybody there. That was his, that was his communication to everyone. It was such a blessing to, and to see a man crying, you know? To see, to see him feeling his grief allowed everybody else to acknowledge their valid grief. And then the discussion turned a little bit to like, but how do you not get stuck in it? Because like I was saying, for me grieving for the earth, there was this unconscious aspect where I was actually grieving for myself because I am the earth, you know, a seamless part of the earth. Like right now, I'm hanging out in nature. I've gone for some time in nature, you know, to recharge. <laughs> right in the airport, hanging out in nature. The wild is not the nature. Yeah, yeah. And um, so we were talking about how you get stuck in grief when you don't have any way to um, to make it acknowledged as our own grief as well and to scrub the deck and, and release the grief you then just get stuck going around in cycles of grief despair anger grief despair anger numbness grief despair and um, well i'm just talking about your framework here is is that you just go through the process of emotions underneath grief is well first Stunning numbness. Stunning numbness. First numbness. Yeah, I made you add that on because I was like, numbness is a feeling. Yeah. First numbness, then anger, like, rah, and then <laughs> pain. Fear. Oh, numbness, fear. fear. You do it. I can't even remember. <laughs> so anyway, thanks, Amanda, for bringing this forth because it is vital. You're saying we are suffering the conditions of our society. We're suffering climate chaos, we're suffering the death of other species, we're suffering the poison of the atmosphere and the waters, right? There's suffering. And um, there are this uh, response to our life circumstance that are very real and very valid. They are numbness, fear, mm -hmm. anger, mm -hmm. pain, in that order. Most of the population are in the state of numbness. Now I'm saying that's a valid state. You, you know, being born into the situation you're born into, uh, in the very limiting conditions, your, your, your response of your organism is to be numb. Fair enough, <laughs> you know? Or your response is fear. Fair enough. A very real fear, you know, of being born into the societies that we're born into. And then anger. I was saying fear and anger actually are valid emotions and necessary emotions of Mother Nature. They allow us to protect ourselves. The organism is protected through fear. You know, the bear in the forest, you run away in fear. Or if the bear, bear gets too close, you pick up a branch and you whack it in anger. You know, it's keeping you safe. Very valid emotions. And then there's a bigger emotion behind fear and anger, and that's pain. And pain is Mother Nature's uh, method to care for the organism. You take your hand out of the fire when there's pain, or you pain demands its own reduction. So you, you know, you turn over in bed or something because the shoulder's getting sore. You know, it's it. Pain is nurturing. It is the function of Mother Nature. And I say, go through the sequence of emotions. Know that they're there. Know that they're valid. Don't judge yourself for being in any of those emotions. Predict predict the next one coming. Know that the one that you're in is valid, but also yeah, if you're angry, then there's pain behind the anger. Go to the pain as quickly as you can. And then get to grief. You get to grief for the shoddy deal that's been dished up on humanity and the other species. And that's the situation right now. Get to grief and in grief come compassion, the siddhis or the gifts of compassion. So allow yourself to get to grief. And in grief, there's a sort of a magic where you can start to be compassionate to yourself 
and everybody else in your life and what a difficult circumstance that you're in. Mm. So get to grief. And this yoga allows you to participate in those mo in, in, in all that sequence of emotions and not get stuck in any one. But it's not to deny anyone either. Every emotion is valid. We're connected to each emotion, including even numbness. I had a woman in Germany just the other day started weeping in class. And she said, thank you for letting me know that my numbness is a feeling, mm -hmm. that it's valid. She felt all right about herself suddenly, you know. Mm -hmm. People are born into dreadful circumstances that they are rightly numb about. As if we get, glide through the sequence of emotions and get to grief, get to compassion, and then start being compassionate on yourself and everybody else and, and on compassionate to Mother Nature. And this, the yogas of participation in the given reality, allows you to feel uh, the tangible and valid connection to all your experience, including difficult experience, which are the uh, apparently limiting emotions, but necessary emotions. So I hope that's clear. Take that home. <laughs> Allow yourself to go through the sequence, get to grief. Then be kind to yourself through practice. Yeah, I'm just thinking, you know how you said pain demands its own reduction, right? That you'll... But it seems to me that most of the time when we feel pain, we demand its reduction in the wrong place. You know, like feeling pain in the shoulder instead of rolling over saying, I've got a shit bed. <laughs> <laughs> Go shopping for another bed. Yeah. <laughs> Massage bed. Yeah. I, I don't know, what do you think about that? Yeah, right. Well, these yogas uh, that came from the great tradition that Krishnamacharya rescued from Tibet before they completely disappeared, I'm telling you it was pre-consumerism <laughs> yoga. It's like anybody can do it. You don't need to buy it. You can have it. You know, maybe buy my app. It costs three dollars. <laughs> <laughs> it was a joke. <laughs> but you know, we don't. We don't want. <laughs> yeah. We don't want to. We don't want to sell anything here. We want the public to get this on every street corner in Australia and cut through the misogynism of the young men that created the idea of yoga and the branding of yoga as some exaggeration on the body and mind. Some exaggerated gymnastics that you do in the mind or body. Cut through that and make sure that we get what Malika is doing everywhere and get it done quickly. It's very touching for me to meet you, sir, and the, um, the Australian men who are here yesterday, like working men, you, sir, coming and going, Inhale and exhale, mm. and feeling the power mm. of your own in your own life through and the intimacy with your own life. Kind of like feeling myself in this the whole presence of it. That's kind of that whole thing, not just like what's in here, but just yeah, it's good. Yeah, you feel the context of yeah, the body, which yeah. is the natural environment. It, it's mm -hmm. context, it's dependent on air and light and water and ground and sky and unknown, all seen and unseen conditions of reality itself. You are at one with that. And this is the anciently given means for you to participate in that. And I, you know, I, I know you felt it, you see that your body loves its breath. Mm -hmm. It's a love relationship and the inhale loves the exhale. It's a literal love relationship and a requirement for each other. Male, female, in same sex or opposite sex intimacy, a requirement. And that you, you know, just let me for now call you, you know, a regular Australian male. You're not actually, <laughs> <laughs> because you're here in this room. But please bring in the, the, the men. Bring them in. I mean, maybe that you could do this. Maybe you have the skill and the network to do this. Bring the men in and help them go inhale, pause, exhale. Mm -hmm. And this is the, you know, the subject, the name of this program is that Bandha is Bhakti. Bhakti means devotion to life or connection, embrace to reality itself, that some people may call God. So when we go inhale, 
pause. There is Jalandhara Bandha, the head is lowered to the heart like this. And then I go exhale, and it might be a forward bend. And the abdominals come in and up. It's called Mula Bandha and Udhyana Bandha, the strength of the body base. And the strength of your base and spine allows the head to just drop to its source, to the heart, to life itself. You see, what I'm always saying is that the mind, there's no problem to mind. Mind is beautiful. Mind is a function of life. Mind is a function of relatedness, you know. We, we clear the mind by, you know, I link my breath to the whole body, then the mind automatically follows the breath. And then the mind becomes informed of its source, which is life itself. The mind is a function of life. Has everybody got that? Mind is not an imaginary dissociated thought structure, you know, demanding attention away from its life. That's what we think it is, you know, dissociation from life. It's like it's not really there. It's like a mirage in the mirage in the desert. It's not there, this imaginary, imaginary mind. You see on time. So the, there's power in this matter. <laughs> Strength, receiving, the strength of the body base allows the head to go boom, and acknowledge its source, which is the heart, the hridaya, right? the first cell of life that appeared when you appeared, one cell from which the spine appeared in three days in the head, right? But you are that heart, the nurturing power of life is unfolding from the heart like flower petals like this, you see. And when you go inhale, exhale, this source of the mind is revealed to the mind. It's a profound practice. And I'm saying, do the yoga. Don't worry about the doctrinal ideas of meditation. Do yoga and meditation will spontaneously arise. Meditation, what is, you know, clarity of mind will occur through the sadhana. It's a very interesting word, sadhana, means that which you can do. You can't meditate. You can't get enlightened. You can't realize God. Forget it. You'll never get enlightened. <coughs> Forget it. Do the sadhana and value that sadhana above all else. <laughs> the intimacy with your own embodiment, the intimacy with your breath, the intimacy of the inhale merging with the exhale, the intimacy of male merging with female, right? In life, value that above all else. And sir, you've got Australia, men in Australia, take it to them, please. Find the way, and it might be tricks of the internet or tricks of commerce and marketing to get all Australian ma males going, inhale, exhale, oh my God, that feels good, thank you. Mm -hmm. And I don't there's a lot think of people I teaching and you know, all over the world there's people teaching in unorthodox ways outside mm. of studios, you know, like one friend who takes expeditions into the outback and she teaches the miners while she's doing it because they see her doing it and they get interested and she has no conflict with them and so she knows that perhaps if she lays those seeds, you know, it's mm. a positive thing. Well, I've got another friend who started teaching via Tinder she would meet me on Tinder <laughs> and say, uh, and then they'd swipe on her, she'd say, hey, do you want a yoga lesson? And they'd be like, yeah. <laughs> and then they'd turn up and she was serious. <laughs> and she'd give them a yoga lesson and she'd say, good, now go away for a week and practice and call me when we've done it. <laughs> and now she's teaching men's yoga classes uh, for like three times a week. And wow. they're just working class men in rural New Zealand and they love her, you know? Yeah. Beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> like everybody can be that creative. You don't have to be in a studio. Please, like women, please think about and the men. You know, first date yoga lesson. We do practice all weeks. Well, let's have a second date. It'll be great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a really good concept, you know. Yeah. You will save yourself so much time and energy in the long run. Yeah. 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 Her name is Vanessa, and she lives in New Plymouth, which is, you know, fairly small. You know, no, the other side, she's in Hawke's Bay. Oh, Hawke's Bay, right. You know, a little small town, New Zealand. You know, the, the blokes are there. 
and they they don't know about yoga. Nobody's telling them. Yeah, and then I, they send you messages like, "Oh, that was good. Most things are pretty hard, eh? But that felt quite soft." <laughs> yeah. It's like simple language, but the feeling they're expressing is yeah. radical and profound in their words. And that they can get it. Krishnamacharya teach in the way that is relevant to each person. You know, respect the person. If the guy's a coal miner out of, you know, uh, Port Hedland, respect that person yeah. and give it to him according to his language. But mm -hmm. a coal miner in Port Hedland can go, inhale, thank you so much. It feels, you know, and you'll create a profound change in that person's embodiment to become receptive. And even his sexuality to become receptive and feeling and sensitive, you know, rather than the uh, dreadful normative patterns of male female that are there right now. So that's the mission. Yeah. Sir, you've got Australia. Thank you. <laughs> Take it on. And, uh, you know, we're, we are joking, but we are serious. No, no, you're serious. Yeah. 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 It I, can I, be I, done. I was talking with someone here on the phone about this kind of stuff this morning coming here uh, about the sort of dissociation of people that are doing their spiritual stuff that are actually kind of almost pulling shit apart you know uh, and that lack of real feeling coming from the heart with what you're doing and um, see I, I got it Craig brought you yesterday and you knew nothing about this Craig knew nothing about it. He stumbled in to at Flow Festival. He he got his mate along. You immediately, hey, you got here, and we only had one session together, and you got the complete relevance of this for your entire life and why you'd want to do it. So thank you. And the conditions to teach yoga: three qualifications. One is that you have a good teacher yourself. Two, you practice yourself. Three, you care about others. Mm -hmm. And you have those qualifications. You can do that. You know, you do your own practice. Of, so, what I'm saying, 40 days of practice, and then start to show people. And you don't know where that's going to go, and it can go. And this is what we're talking about, climate change activism. Mm -hmm. You know, get this into the public. Yeah, I want to say one more thing, which is that a lot of people feel like in order to teach, you have to do a really long course, like several weeks or months or years, in order to be valid as a teacher and have anything to offer. And uh, it's because almost all teaching is on the basis of knowledge, which it takes a long time to accumulate enough knowledge so that you can have power over other people, you know? And uh, I just want to say like, this is, because it's, because it's your own practice, then doing it yourself gives you the capability to teach it to other people. Because you're not teaching them any kind of a knowledge system you're just giving them the skills to practice for themselves. And therefore, you only actually need a very small amount of knowledge. It's like you're handing out hammers, and then everybody just goes and builds their own house. You know, you don't have to have a degree in house building. <laughs> right? I get what you're saying. Like you're just giving the tool, you're not giving the whole... Yesterday, know, yeah. we quoted Andy Raba, so what is the use of learning bodies of knowledge if you don't have knowledge of the body? Mm -hmm. So this is your knowledge. I'd say the secrets of the universe are in you as you. Right? Is that true, sir? You get that statement? Mm. Yeah. So this practice is the participation in the secrets of the universe that are already utterly established in you. You don't have to do anything exaggerated to know them. No book learning no exaggerated meditations, no exaggerated uh, gymnastics on the body, but these principles. And I think it, I've noticed it happens naturally for people too, without any real ambition, because they do their own practice, they feel better, and they care about the people around them, and they say, hey, give this a go, because I'm feeling good, you know? It doesn't, it's not like a world of power, or a, I know more than you, or, you know, it's like, Oh, dude, I'm, I'm feeling good and you're feeling a bit shit. Here, try this, you know. So thanks for letting us come all the way to this. And I, as a summary, I'd like to offer this. So we had a session yesterday. We'll do another one now. And I want you to do this practice for yourself for a short time each day, say 10 minutes, you know, 20 minutes for you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and because you're specially qualified, you see. Specially qualified. 
but and then uh, find a few good people in your life to show this to. You know, find friends, family, and practice showing them what you are doing. And then you're practicing uh, the teaching of yoga, and you learn to teach by teaching. You know, and you have to feel free to make mistakes. You know, when you teach. But try to show them. This is what Krishna Chai said. You learn to teach by teaching. So in the course of your 40 days of practice, find a few good people. Say, hey, I want to teach you. And then do the same thing with them. Hold them to their personal practice. This is my suggestion. This is my offering for uh, Australia. And I have my great ally here. And Rita and Rita. It's getting the job done, at least on this street corner. <laughs> <laughs> so here are the principles. We went through them yesterday. One, the body movement is the breath movement, exactly one and the same synchronistic, right? Two, the inhale is from above as receptivity. The exhale is from below as strength. And this also includes this magic word bandha, the intelligent cooperation of muscle groups, right? that the asana creates in the polarity of strength received in the male-female uh, polarities of your own body, right? Exhale, inhale. Three, the breath envelops the movement. You put the body in an envelope of the breath. I inhale, then I move, and I'm still inhaling when the hands come together. Pause, exhale, then move. Got that? Four, and that's the one of today, is that asana creates bandha in the breath ratio. Right? Asana creates the bandha. Exhale, I do it. Abdominals and inhale. Right? The asana is bandha. And then five is the beautiful one. Asana, pranayama, meditation and life are a seamless process where asana allows for pranayama and pranayama makes the mind clear and then meditation arises spontaneously. An important one for you, sir, we don't intentionally try to do this thing called meditation. We allow it to arise. Mm -hmm. Your Krishnamacharya is a beautiful state. Even go all the way to you cannot meditate. The mind struggling with the mind will not be meditation. Mm -hmm. Meditation is a siddhi or a gift of your practice. A gift of sadhana but the sadhana is your asana and pranayama so you when you realize the beauty of that statement you start getting serious about asana and putting it into your life asana is not there like in support of meditation which is a higher practice or something the asana is the high practice of direct embrace of eternity you, you're on you with me there sir you understand what i'm saying and it's easy anybody can do it. Thank you for um, anything else? Anything else? No. Right, thank you. Thank you very much for a beautiful chat. Thank you, Rosalind Atkinson, for, uh, your, for your lifelong activism and now turn to yoga. I'm just so happy to feel affected, you know. Mm. It's like the most rewarding thing you can imagine. And it does bring out all your latent skills and talents, doesn't it? Mm. Yeah. And you know, you wander through life collecting all these random experiences and actually you might have a word for it. Multi-potentialite. Multi Everything we have is useful. Yeah. <laughs> Alright, thank you. So let's do a practice. Um, could everybody lie down for a second? Thank <laughs> you.